us pray. Lord of all power and might, the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name, increase in us true religion, nourish us with all goodness, and bring forth in us the fruit of good works. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. There's been a particular question sort of floating around in the air everyone, everywhere around me right now. It's there in those sardonic social media posts, you know the ones, like what's next 2020, locusts? I'm sure you've seen the like. It shouldn't have surprised me then that when I asked people to submit questions for our podcast, J-O-Y, someone wanted to know if God is good, why is there suffering? It's the age-old question, the one that people have wrestled with for thousands of years. Why is there evil? Why must we suffer? Surely, if God is all good and all powerful, then God would not allow the pain, evil, and misfortune that surrounds us on every side. COVID-19 might be a new virus, but the question of suffering is as old as time. So I shouldn't have been surprised either when I discovered it hiding behind the text in today's Gospel reading. At Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do you say that I am? Peter was the first to make the bold and true proclamation, You are the Messiah. Peter has glimpsed the true identity of Jesus, but he doesn't understand it yet. So Jesus begins to teach his disciples that he will suffer and that he will be killed. And Peter just cannot hear it. He refuses to believe it. God forbid it, Lord, he says. This must never happen to you. Behind that Resistance lurks the same question. Why must there be suffering? Surely God's beloved Son should be exempt from such pain. And maybe behind there, there is even this hidden hope. If my Messiah could be spared, then perhaps his followers could be too? The question is too big for any one podcast. It's too big for any one sermon. It's too big, period. But perhaps there are some things that could be said. The answer that has always seemed to me to be the most obvious one, and yet the one that we don't like to spend very much time thinking about, is that we suffer because we are mortal. God gave us bodies of flesh and blood. They are bodies through which we experience the world and all the wonderful sensations of taste and smell and sight and touch. We are given hands with which to help others in need and arms to embrace them. We have feet and legs upon which we will journey this life and accompany one another through all there is to experience. On the sixth day of creation, after creating humankind, God took it all in and said, It is very good. And it is. And yet, there is no living thing that is without vulnerability. Human bodies are subject to injury and disease and aging. The damage to these bodies is painful and limiting, some, sometimes suddenly and sometimes over a long period of time. One day we must all shuffle off this mortal coil, but not one of us will get to that eternal life without having first gone through some suffering. Another response to that question of suffering is to say that we suffer because God loves us enough not to control us. Scripture teaches us that God is good, or to put a finer point on it, that God is love. God's power, as revealed to us in Scripture, is great indeed, but it is not perfectly limitless. 
The Creator has shared power with creation. God has given God's power away, giving us free will, the power to choose. And God does that because He knows that there is no love without free will. So we suffer. Sometimes we suffer because we have used our free will poorly, and sometimes we suffer because others have. Perhaps we can limit our suffering to some degree by living faithfully and lovingly, but we will never escape the pain that is caused by human sin and error. Yet to exclude the possibility of evil is to exclude the possibility of love. Love is not love unless it is chosen, unless there is an alternative. So like a lover, God woos us, constantly calling us toward mutual and life-giving and liberating love. But God will not force us. We must be able to choose selfishness, to choose destruction even, so that we may also have the power to choose life and love, which is another reason why we suffer. We suffer not only so that we may love, we suffer because we love. Who among us has never been moved to tears by witnessing even the suffering of a stranger? Our hearts ache for a friend when she receives a hard diagnosis. We worry for our parents and sacrifice for our kids. The loss of a loved one can be earth shattering. If we had no compassion, you see, we might remain untouched. But then we would also lose out on all those dear relationships that make our lives meaningful. The strangers that open our eyes to a wider world. The friends who make us laugh after a day that has made us cry. The parents who have provided a safe harbor and the kids who carry our hopes for the future. Maybe less love would mean less suffering, but I wouldn't make that trade for any of you. And Jesus certainly did not make that trade for a single one of us. I couldn't help but notice that in our gospel today, Jesus doesn't answer the question of why. Peter does not understand why Jesus should have to suffer, but Jesus doesn't spend his time sitting the disciples down and explaining the problem of suffering to them. Perhaps he knows it's a stumbling block. Instead, Jesus tells them what to do with their suffering. If any want to become my followers, he says, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Jesus will not choose to avoid the suffering of the world. Instead, he will enter deeply into it, deeply into our suffering for our sake, for love's sake. And he asks us to follow. To get there, we first have to deny ourselves, which is to recognize that we are not alone. Suffering or the fear of it will often trick us into thinking that we are alone, that there is nothing more powerful or more important than our own grief or our own pain or our own fear. But it is a trick. We are not alone. And together, our love is more powerful than any evil the world may inflict upon us. We are strong together, but first, we must get out of our own way. Then we must take up our cross. All that sin, brokenness, anger, and injustice, these are heavy burdens. You have to put your back into it, but you won't be lifting it alone. Together with Christ, you will carry it to that holy hill where God may redeem it all. God took that Roman instrument of terror and death and turned it into life and salvation. 
the pain that we offer will be transformed into good. This Jesus whom we follow will not take us on a path of avoidance. We need to be prepared for that. There will be suffering along the way and we will not always understand it. But we won't need to because we won't be alone. Jesus is leading us along the pathway of love and it always leads to life. So may God give you the grace not to sell yourself short, grace to risk something big for something good, grace to remember that the world is now too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. So may God take your minds and think through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. And may God take your hearts and set them on fire. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm.